Good morning, all. Uh, we are now live and streaming. Thank you. Morning. We'll uh, roll call in just a minute here. Stand by, please. Good morning and welcome to the, um, what are we on? September 8th uh, Emergency Advisory Committee meeting. I am coming to you live from the isolation center because I have symptoms and I'm not feeling well this morning. So uh, I'll, uh, but I'm happy to <clears throat> get the meeting started. And um, uh, Councillor Walters is the uh, deputy if I need to hand off the chair. Uh, I'll recognize that we are virtually having today's meeting on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, the Nakota Sioux, the Soto, and the Blackfoot peoples, as well as one of the great homelands of the Métis Nation. Um, I'm now going to roll call from a different list than I usually use, so I'll be on your toes because um, I don't have my usual orange sheet in front of me. So uh, I'm going to go by by uh, ward number. Councillor Knack, are you with us? Good morning. Morning, Councillor Essinger. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Zadig. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Briquet. Morning. Morning, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Morning, Councillor McKean. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Katarina. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Henderson. Not with us this morning, obviously. Councillor Carmel. Good morning. Morning, uh, Councillor Walters. Councillor Walters. Hopefully he'll be able to join us. Uh, I think Councillor McKean is the acting mayor. Uh, if we need him, uh, Councillor Nickel. Good morning. Morning, and Councillor Banga. Councillor Banga. Satsuriya Kal. Wahi Guruji ka kalsa, Wahi Guruji ki pate. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, I do need a motion to adopt our fairly simple agenda. Councillor Essinger, thank you. Um, please vote. I'm a yes. We're still waiting on a few votes. Uh, Mr. Chair, yours, Councillor Cartmel's, uh, Councillor Hamilton's is a yes. And we have all the votes, uh, except for yours, Mr. Mayor. I'm a yes. Thank you. 
play the vote, please. Uh, that's carried unanimously. Uh, did we take care of the minutes for the last meeting the other day, or do we still have them here? We still have them here. Councillor Knack? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll move the adoption of the meeting minutes from the August 12th, 2021 Emergency Advisory Committee meeting. Thank you. Any questions, concerns, errors, or omissions? Not seeing any, then perhaps I'll just take unanimous consent. Any objection to the approval of the minutes? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Sorry, I'm just trying to log into eScribe and book a test at the same time. <laughs> so got a couple of balls in the air at the same time. Bear with me. So hearing no objections, we'll uh, uh, consider the minutes approved. Uh, we just have the one item 3.1 for discussion today. So we'll uh, consider that selected since that's the purpose of our meeting. And I will turn it over to Mr. Corbold to uh, brief us on the COVID-19 situation. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Joining us uh, today from AHS is Dr. Michael Zachary, the Medical Officer of uh, Health with Alberta Health Services. Also joining uh, city staff include members of the executive leadership team this morning, Nicole Parry and Nancy Jacob Jacobson with the COVID-19 Recovery Advisory Task Team. Uh, there are five major topics I would like to discuss uh, this morning. The first is the current state of COVID-19 in our city. Second is the recent provincial announcements made uh, on Friday of last week. Third, our operational approach responding to some, to the, some of those decisions. Fourth is an update on some of the internal staffing matters here in the city. And finally, community perspectives, which may inform future considerations for this committee. Case numbers in the Edmonton Health Zone increased after the public health restrictions were lifted at the beginning of July. We are now seeing a case rate of more than 300 per 100,000, which is triple the rate at which our mask bylaw is activated, as you know. While hospitalizations and ICU numbers are not seeing quite as high a rate of growth, they have increased. The difference and what makes the fourth wave uh, different from the third wave is, of course, the presence of vaccinations. Vaccines have proven effective at preventing severe outcomes. More than 5.6 million vaccine doses have been administered in Alberta as of September 6th, and the number continues to increase. Vaccination rates also look promising, with nearly 82% of eligible Edmontonians vaccinated with their first dose, and nearly 75% with their full uh, both doses vaccinations. This next slide shows our public recovery dashboard. Vaccination rates have continued to increase, which would mean progress on health is moving forward. Given the increase in caseloads, however, we have dialed back both the caseload measure and the recovery measure since last month. Progress on health has been moving forward. For example, participation in recreation programs continues to grow. However, the increased caseloads are compromising the move toward green as the hospitalizations and ICU numbers are causing challenges for the healthcare system. On the, economics, on the economic side, while the news is generally positive, it is not consistently so. Transit ridership is up from last month and up from this time last year. However, it is still well below what we'd consider regular volumes. As discussed during the budget update yesterday, we are tracking ridership levels at about half of what we would regularly see. It is too early to report August numbers for developing development permits, the construction value of building permit numbers, and the unemployment rate. There are a number of actions which will have positive and negative economic impacts. Border restrictions have been eased, but the province has recommended pausing return to work arrangements. Alcohol service has been restricted, which affects the hospitality industry, while mask mandates are helping people feel more comfortable in public spaces. As directed by Council, administration began implementation of the temporary face covering bylaw effective Friday, September 3rd. The same day, the Government of Alberta announced four new temporary measures and introduced new vaccine incentives. Effective this past Saturday, September 4th, masks are now mandatory throughout the province for all indoor public spaces and workplaces. Schools are not required to implement masking and school boards will continue to set their own policies. Restaurants, cafes, bars, pubs, nightclubs and other licensed establishments are required to end alcohol service at 10 p.m. Unvaccinated Albertans are encouraged to limit in-person contacts. The province is strongly recommending that unvaccinated Albertans limit their indoor social gatherings 
to close contacts of only two cohort families up to a maximum of 10 people. Alberta also recommended that plans for in-person return to work be paused and that employers revert to work from home where possible. If employees are working on location, employees must mask for all indoor settings except when alone at a workstation distance from others. In addition, the province introduced a new vaccine incentive. A one-time incentive of $100 is available for adult Albertans who receive a first or second dose of vaccine between September 3rd and October 14th. Registration for the benefit begins on Monday, September 13th. Finally, we've learned that testing for COVID-19 will continue well beyond September 27th, and the provincial order for masking on transit has been incorporated into the current order requiring masks in all indoor spaces. The province has not indicated how long the current order will be in effect. The masking requirements of the new provincial health order and Edmonton's bylaw are slightly different from one another. The provincial order applies in most places such as a workplace areas and are not that are not accessible to the public. The provincial order also contains exemptions that do not exist in our city of Edmonton bylaw such as an exemption for worship services at a place of worship and performance activities such as theater where actors cannot remain distance from one another. In those situations our bylaw still requires that masks be worn indoors as of now. Prior to the provincial announcement on Friday, administration heard feedback from local businesses about the impact of the mask bylaw and what it would have as an impact on their events and operations. They asked about masking exemptions for venues with mandatory vaccination policies. And I want to be clear, there is no exemption in either pro the provincial order or our bylaw related to vaccines. And as city manager, I have no authority to grant exemptions under the bylaw currently. Under our current bylaw, we require people to wear masks at indoor events. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge how difficult it has been for the business community. They have told us how difficult it is to manage a business when the rules keep changing and to stay current uh, with which government is making uh, decisions and requirements. We have heard them and I want to thank all businesses in Edmonton for helping to keep the customers and all citizens safe. To help with the implementation of the municipal mask bylaw, we have developed a toolkit for business with free downloadable posters and signs. They are available on our website at edmonton.ca backslash masks. We are continuing to work with the improve, uh, business improvement uh, associations, the BIAs, to share products with their members so they have the information they need to comply with the bylaw and provincial health order. Our bylaw enforcement teams will be taking an education first in, uh, enforcement approach on public transit, peace officers will also continue to provide masks to those who do not have them. They will also be working with provincial enforcement counterparts and the Edmonton Police Service. I note that municipal peace officers do not currently have the authority to enforce the provincial health order, but they can indeed enforce the city's bylaws. At this time, we are seeing high levels of compliance, which is consistent with uh, Edmontonians over the past year and a half during the pandemic. Uh, with our masking in facilities on transit and recreation centers and out in the community. So this is indeed positive news. <coughs> the city leadership team believes it's essential that the city of Edmonton do whatever we can to help reduce the community spread of this virus that has already caused so much hardship to individuals, families and the health system and our economy. Based on current infection and hospital rates in Alberta, we believe it is prudent to follow provincial recommendations and ask our office staff to continue to work from home until November 15th. All employees were notified of this step yesterday. Uh, when they do return to the office, I want to remind uh, folks that it will be with flexible hybrid work arrangements for many of them. Although we were looking forward to employees returning to workplaces, uh, and I, we were looking for that to happen in September, the safety of our employees in the community must be paramount and is paramount and we will make decisions based on evidence and medical advice. For the majority of city employees who work in the recreation centers, garages, shops in the field, we are continually reviewing our safety measures and we will enhance them as needed. The implementation of the vaccination disclosure policy I informed council of on August 30th is well under the way. The disclosure completion rate was 65% as of yesterday and several areas are well above 80%. Three of our union partners, the Amalgamated Transit Union, the Edmonton Firefighters Union, 
and the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers have sent messages to their members encouraging them to complete the disclosure and we really appreciate this extra effort by those unions. The reporting deadline is September 10th and we are awaiting the information coming from the vaccination disclosures before making any decisions on additional safety measures and discussing what next steps, if any, will be required based on that factual data. There have been provincial decisions of direction and I want to be clear that things continue to change. There are many discussions about vaccine passports and even calls for the city to consider such passports. And I would note that they require health information which is gathered by the province. Regional mayors recently wrote to the provincial health minister asking for additional action. A vaccine passport, additional masking requirements at schools and post-secondary facilities and access to more detailed data. Businesses, especially those in the hospitality sector, are asking whether it's appropriate to exempt mask requirements at events and for people who have shown they are fully vaccinated. As noted previously, at this point, our answer is if an exemption is not stated uh, in both the provincial order or the city's bylaw, masks are still required. We are paying attention to these conversations. We also have options going forward and I would like to outline them. If Council wishes to consider this matter further, it would have three options. First, we could confirm that the masking direction in the current bylaw remains in effect by not considering any amendments and therefore no additional action would be required. Second, Council could allow for more permitted exemptions by adjusting its bylaw to mirror the exemptions allowed provincially, for example, while performing or at a place of worship. This would require a Council decision. Third, Council could amend its bylaw to delegate me the authority as City Manager to determine exemptions in situations where it would not conflict with the Provincial Order. An administration could bring forward bylaw amendments as, at a meeting of Council as early as this Friday. There are options on the table today and I invite the Committee co to consider these and refer them to Council if you are recommend recommending a direction that would require uh, Council's decisions. I also want to be clear that while this is the last scheduled emergency advisory committee meeting, it is not the end of the mandate of this council. COVID is still here and the city remains able to manage it throughout the election. Should additional council direction be required, I am very comfortable calling the mayor and asking that council be convened at any point prior to the swearing in ceremony after the municipal election date. Similarly, I'm confident making decisions within the authority of council as delegated to administration currently. Should there be any changes to provincial requirements in the coming weeks, we are ready to respond accordingly and get the decisions we need from this council. And with that, we are happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Um, Councillor Knack is up first. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Provold, for the uh, presentation. Uh, maybe, I think it was Dr. Zachary we have today, um, just to start to help inform what, what we would do on the on the bylaw piece. Can you uh, provide the medical rationale for exempting places of worship? Just to see if we should be doing that. I just, I don't know that, I don't know why that decision was made and I don't understand it. Thanks so much, Councillor, for the question. It's a really great question. Uh, what I, I need to highlight is that typically the province would get a bar and municipalities can exceed the bar as appropriate. Um, the current status that we do have in Edmonton, that we, we do have high community transmission. Um, our, our value is 1.32. There is an increase in hospitalization in ICU. Um, there is an increase in rates and number of cases. Um, that all indicates high community transmission. Uh, therefore, if extra steps are considered to be taken, I think that's a reasonable approach to be considered. Uh, I will just add, uh, Councillor Knack, that as of today, uh, none of the Edmonton-based uh, faith communities have requested exemptions uh, from the city bylaw. As far to to my knowledge, we haven't checked with everyone, but I do have the city uh, pottery reaching out to them today. To but so far, consistently, they've said, you know, we plan to mask as per the city bylaw. That's helpful. I just I, just in case the reason I ask is that if we're being asked to consider a aligning I, i'd want to know what the right medical reason because uh, you know so for example we have to mask in a movie theater where everyone's sitting in a place for an hour or two hours 
I'm not sure, and truly, that I'm, I'm not asking in a, in a trying to be a <laughs> disrespectful, but I don't know what the difference is, is sitting in a church environment for an hour um, unmasked. It, it, they seem like they're requiring the same type of action. And so if there was a medical rationale for, for exempting them, then I would want to potentially align with the provincial one, but I haven't heard that just yet, so I'll, I'll keep, keep going. Um, the other question I think you miss, uh, mentioned, Mr. Corbold, is is for so if we have performers, and uh, and so that is one thing I'm wondering about. There are obviously exemptions for um, potentially like sports teams playing indoors and athletes like that. Um, so what we're being asked is, should we have a requirement that, it's, or should we allow for an exemption that if performers are potentially fully vaccinated and there's proof of that, should they all, all performers on that stage be allowed to perform unmasked as long as they are separate from the audience? That is the question you're asking us today? Yes, essentially, uh, Councillor, th those are some of the questions we're getting from uh, the hospitality industry. Um, it's not the only question. The other one we get is, you know, uh, areas that allow dance. Uh, can people go up unmasked dancing, for, for example, on the dance floor? And those are a lot of the questions uh, we're getting from hospitality. And I think one of the reasons we're getting those questions is there's a bit of confusion because of, uh, of things not being aligned. So, yeah, that's why we thought it important to come to this committee to, to at least think about um, those op options we outlined. Sure. So I, I guess then again, maybe to Dr. Zachary, uh, because this one seems a little more nuanced. Uh, if we allow a professional team to perform their action or their sport in an indoor environment, uh, I, I'm guessing there, there's a requirement for those professional teams to be fully vaccinated to, in order to allow for that. Um, so I, I guess I'd want to ask is, does that seem like a reasonable step to take for uh, stage performers, uh, if they had the same sort of requirement as we put on to a professional sports team. Well, thanks so much for, for the question as well. Um, so vaccination is, is an important intervention for prevention of transmission. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a high community transmission um, in Edmonton at the moment um, with the higher R value increased hospitalization in ICU, increased number and rate of cases, our healthcare system is pretty tight. So any steps that are considered to be undertaken could be reasonable and appropriate uh, to mitigate the risk of uh, transmission in, in our communities. Um, bearing in mind also the ethical, legal and social implications of communities. I'm out of time. I'll have a few more questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, next. Yeah, Mr. Corbold, uh, Andre. So in terms of the mechanics of actually between now and the next council, so let's, let's, we all know these, there's difficulty in legislating every situation. You would have to agree with that. That's kind of, that's unachievable, correct? Yeah, correct. I think there's been a lot of questions since uh, since the um, the bylaw went into effect, and and we're merely trying to respond to those questions and and you know uh, really I think get rid of the confusion as best we can. Yes, and so also there's probably it's a, it's going to be a moving target over every week. I, I think you would agree with me there. So now to me it just becomes a question: How can the city respond fast enough in the situation? So what would you rather prefer? Would you rather prefer the discretion for the next four to six weeks to be in your office to deal with these one-off situations? Or, or would you prefer something different? Because now it's just right down, we have to get to the mechanics and we have to clarify some of these situations because let's take the arts, for example, and some of the venues. Uh, I understand they're talking about canceling their fall programs if something doesn't change. So uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, my, my preference would be to get some delegated authority with, within reason to, uh, to be uh, uh, somewhat flexible based on some of the needs. Um, but for example, with worship sites, I, if I had the dele delegated authority at this point, I, I would not do an exemption there because nobody's calling for one or asking for one. Um, and people seem very um, 
reasonable and, and certainly the faith-based groups are seem to be happy to mask in accordance with the bylaw. So that would be the easiest thing for me, but I also want to make it clear that there, there's nothing preventing us from getting council together if needed. Yeah, but, but let's let's put it this way. So, Mr. Corbal, how would this uh, delegate? Okay, you know, I'm I'm the first person to say that that council should be doing this, but there's a question of timeliness and flexibility that has to be addressed here, and I don't you think kind of question. What kind of wording are we talking about giving you that discretion, and what would be the recommended timeline? Because I I do believe in the you know giving that only in a limited capacity if I was to support something. Yeah, well, I would say that, you know, we're making sort of decisions from uh, out to sort of mid-November at this point, uh, which would be a reasonable time frame uh, from my perspective. I think uh, we can work on the wording if there's a desire of the committee to, um, to take this recommendation to council uh, as early as this Friday. But for example, I, I you know, I've, I mentioned that, um, you know, some exemptions which we could possibly consider would be ones that align with the province so that we're sort of within a, uh, a bracketing area of you know the city's uh, bylaw and and the province's health orders so staying within the confines of those two wouldn't say they're that extreme uh, but that would be something simple that we could perhaps uh, maintain and I think roughly the you know early November to mid November is, is about the timeline required um, but again uh, happy to let council do. Okay, okay, let's just get to the number. November fifteenth, November first. Is that what we're talking about? Well, and I, that, in that kind of situation, I would say November fifteenth, just because it's consistent okay. with some other timelines we've heard. It's a little difficult to answer that because uh, in previous health orders that have come down, the province has been clear that they would be in place for a period of time. In this instance, they they said until further notice. So okay. Let's say November. I'm going to suggest November 15th. We put that delegated authority to you, and and then then you just have to give us a little sense of the wording around it, um, because there's always this issue that some people will always think it's too little, and some people will say it's too much. So it's uh, I would like to see the wording on the balancing effect that uh, you think would be reasonable, because we're all reasonable people here. So I, I what do you, do you think that would be? Would you recommend that approach? Yeah, I think that would be good. And I'll just see if Ms. Jacobs had, uh, has some comments to make on what that wording might look like, because I know she's been thinking about this for the last couple of days. Uh, thanks, Mr. Corbold. The wording would likely look along the lines of saying that the city manager can grant exemptions in addition to the exemptions stated in the bylaw, but provided that those exemptions don't conflict with the provincial order, because we absolutely cannot change a provincial requirement. If masks are required provincially, there's nothing we can do to vary that. But what we can do is fix the disconnect where someone is exempt provincially, but not municipally. And we can grant Andre that authority for a very time limited basis. Yeah, that, I think that makes good sense. So uh, depending on other questions, Mr. Mayor, I think that uh, that's kind of a recommendation I think we should consider uh, for, for council. Well, let's. Uh, it's we're in a tricky situation with uh, the decisions we can make at um, at, at committee. Uh, so we'll have to figure out the right form for for uh, feedback from Mr. Corbold and direction for a potential council meeting. We will need a council meeting on Friday, one way or the other. Uh, so that time's all held in our calendar, uh, and and we can uh, figure out what form of direction is required. But let's ask some more questions uh, while we give the clerk some time to think that through. So thank you, Councillor Nickel. Next up is Councillor Banga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a few questions for uh, Dr. Zachary first. Um, uh, uh, first question is, uh, um, from time to time, some people claim that uh, they have medical condition um, uh, for not wearing a mask. Is there any provision provincially that considers that at this point in time? Um, thank you, Councillor. Could you please elaborate on that question? Well, if uh, I uh, uh, say, you know, phone up and say uh, I have a medical condition, I can't wear a mask, uh, is there any provision provincially that uh, these people would be? Exempted somehow. My understanding is there is uh, conditions where uh, 
exemptions could be granted uh, within the Alberta Health website. And this has to be a written exemption from their position. And, uh, and, and this has been outlined by Alberta Health. Okay. So would, just to be clear, is it uh, a doctor's note and then present it to Alberta Health or they just get a doctor's note and uh, just keep it? But no, Alberta Health would set uh, a set of criteria for exemption. And then if someone believes that they fall under this criteria, then they could connect with their healthcare provider and then their healthcare provider would be able to uh, have this exemption in Britain. Okay. And so currently they, they can be exempted if they have a existing medical condition. Is that? That's my understanding. Okay. All right. And uh, I wanted to understand uh, one other thing. That's uh, uh, this uh, 10 p.m. alcohol cutoff uh, curfew, whatever you want to call it. Could you tell me the rationale behind it, if you know? Well, uh, from a public health standpoint, and I'm going to think about principles in, in public health, so um, interventions could be considered uh, when um, depending on the level of risk. So um, perhaps... Uh, you know, the level of interaction could be affected that would um, somehow limit the transmission of, of the virus within a certain setting. So if we consider the level of interaction, the level of risk, uh, that could be a reasonable approach to take um, in order to limit uh, interaction and mitigate the risk of transmission of the virus. So from a public health standpoint, um, we do review evidence around risk activities and what kind of activities that would increase the risk of transmission and then interventions from evidence and from other jurisdiction approaches would be examined to see if this would be a helpful approach to reduce the risk of transmission based on this uh, uh, behavioral activity and kind of activity that could be uh, contributing to increased transmission. Thank you. Mr. Carvel, uh, just uh, wanted to confirm uh, with you, uh, the sports teams, uh, amateur sports teams, uh, they are still allowed to uh, I guess, uh, proceed with their league action. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And just to clarify, because it came up earlier, professional teams are not required to be fully vaccinated um, as there's a uh, physical activity exemption uh, for that, for those sports teams. Okay. So amateurs, uh, 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 they can, they can, the community teams, whatever they, they can play at this time, right? Without masks. Correct. Okay, and uh, one more question about that uh, is, again, I have some inquiries from a couple of referees. Uh, they were saying, oh, they're not playing, but they're uh, refing the games. Uh, are, are they allowed to wear masks? Uh, or are they uh, allowed to remove their masks? I should yeah, say. I, I would say it's tied to the activity. And referees, in my experience, are usually running around the sports field sometimes at the same exerting the same levels of energy of the athletes and 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 that in my mind would be because they are active they are exempt and that's pretty clear in the orders thank you and uh, i'll come back next up is councillor mckean thank you uh mr mayor and <clears throat> mr corbel i kind of want to start off by just uh recognizing the complexity and the rapidly changing complexity of this pandemic. And thank you, uh, Ms. Jacobson and others for, I suspect a lot of stress and concern you've uh, put into this. So I just wanna say thank you. I won't have many more times to do that. So really appreciate it. Secondly, um, uh, I think you know that we were getting um, some 
uh, uh, some calls from a live music venues last week who were who were upset with the new mask mandate, didn't know how they were going to fit into it. And were we able to cobble together some sort of a middle path for live music venues um, now and in the future? Um, yes, we were, Councillor. However, uh, as we reviewed the bylaw in detail, um, we administration does not have the delegated authority to, you know, precisely execute those uh, those solutions, uh, which is one of the reasons we're coming today to the committee to consider delegating or asking council to delegate that decision to us. So we're somewhat hampered uh, by the letter of the law in terms of the um, the delegated authority, which is why we're one of the reasons we're here today. I uh, got it. So Councillor Nichols' questions and potential motion you're looking at would give you the ability to respond to those individual cases. Correct. Uh, okay, but but at some point the provincial mask mandate sort of envelops ours anyways. Am I right? We can't, we couldn't say to a particular venue, you can do X, Y, and Z if it if it doesn't meet the terms and conditions of the provincial mask mandate. Correct, the, and that's why the language we're, we're, we're trying to put together would have words to the effect of, you know, would not conflict with the provincial health order. Right, right. Um, because we've had, I've had this question, um, but I just want to get it on the record. The city of Edmonton could not do uh, vaccine passports because we would not have access to information to do that. Is that right? That would be certainly my concern, uh, Councillor. Uh, we're not the health authority. We don't have the information to do it. It would be um, uh, difficult to cobble together. And then I think there would be huge questions about uh, would that uh, passport be accepted and uh, uh, considered by any other jurisdictions or, uh, you know, do we, you know, I don't even think we have the, the ability to, to mandate a passport at the municipal level because it really is a medical document and function. Um, not the least of which, you know, as people start to travel, you know, who external to the city would accept a passport. The real solution here on passports is a is is one uh, from the, the medical health authority, which in Canada is provincial. Um, and I, I think that's the best chance of having success uh, if if that that were to be chosen. And, and I think for the municipality to do it would would not be helpful, uh, quite frankly, and cause even more confusion in the system. Yeah, exactly. No, thanks. Thanks for your uh, answers. <clears throat> Thanks. Maybe uh, just building on that, um, that's one of the reasons why I was happy to sign on to the letter with the mayors of the region because that um, that theme, and you can start my time, um, that, that, that theme that has uh, pervaded throughout here of wanting to take action at minimum at the zone level uh, and with consistency across borders with the counties and towns and cities around us. Um, and a an city of Edmonton only vaccine passport really would not, even if we had access to the data, which we don't, really would not work well uh, in a regional context with uh, St. Albert and Beaumont and the counties. And so that's why the mayors were quite uh, unified in our discussion and in, in calling for that. Um, uh, in the letter that we sent out yesterday. So, so just to reinforce that point, um, and, and I guess just to verify then, uh, to turn this into a question, Mr. Corbold, uh, the region would have access to that data, either only the province would. Correct. That's my understanding. It's, uh, AHS and health data. Yeah. Um, so then pivoting a little bit to the question of exemptions, um, one of the, uh, I, I, it's hard to speculate about what the province's rationale is with respect to houses of worship, but there were, part of the issue here with masking is that masking is one tool in the toolkit with other mitigations. And some of the other mitigations and restrictions that were in place previously were limitations on singing in places of worship because of the transmission risk associated with um, um, ex ecstatic exhalation, um, and and is that that restriction is no longer in place? Correct. 
That's correct. Uh, it was not part of the latest health order. Now, it is hard to sing with a mask on, I, I suppose, um, but that's also, which may be one of the arguments uh, and, and crosses over to some questions I have on the performer side of things. Um, but uh, we haven't heard from faith groups who are concerned uh, about the city's position on this, uh, just to verify. I think I heard you say that, but I just wanted to verify because I, I haven't heard that feedback yet into my office, but just want to verify you haven't heard feedback of any concerns with a masking requirement for houses of worship within the city. Yeah, we have not, nobody has brought concerns to us, and I have verified that with the city padre, Mr. John Doubts. Right, okay, yeah, I did catch that. Um, well, that's, that's good, and I understand Calgary has uh, taken the same position? That's our understanding, yes, Your Worship. So there's some consistency there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, I think it's a good sign that we're down to some of these, um, uh, you know, that I think we tie a bow around that one. Um, <clears throat> but on the, on the question of um, endorsing for, uh, for professional purposes of live music, um, you know, it strikes me that, it, you know, karaoke is one thing because that's patron driven. Um, uh, uh, singing, but uh, but where it's in a professional context with with artists, um, really that that is an OHS question as much as anything for the venue and its either its employees or its contractors, and and then obviously, hopefully, I'm sure they have an interest in the safety of their patrons too. But um, is there is there a scenario where we can lean on the OHS rules? Um, to help or, or assume that a responsible proprietor of a, of a, a bar or a theater can make their own OHS assessments about whether the mitigations are sufficient and then that patrons can make a determination for themselves whether they um, feel that the mitigations are sufficient. Because if for us to do a one size fits all on, on performance seems so contingent on, on what's actually going in the venue in terms of distancing, in terms of shielding, in terms of whether there's a vaccination mandate for performers, a whole bunch of variables way outside of our control. So um, your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I, I think that's entirely reasonable, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, for example, we think we're very confident that we could find ways for performances to unmask uh, because you can use things like plexiglass or, or just pure distancing on a stage and, and keep uh, the audience separate. We don't think we can find a good way to allow sort of the public to dance on a dance floor without masks because it's just completely, um, uh, you know, you're going to have all sorts of contacts and, and the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve from a mask policy. And then I would just add that, um, you know, as an example of things that we could and could not do, uh, you know, if we use the language we proposed uh, or will propose to council would be things like, we can't, for example, we wouldn't allow walking with uh, alcohol because the provincial health order expressly says that you can drink alcohol, but you must be seated in a facility to do that. So I, that's a, a good example of where uh, if I were to be delegated this authority, I would not allow people to walk around with drinks because that would be in conflict with the provincial health order. Okay, that's, that's all helpful. Thank you. I'm out of time. Uh, so, um, anybody else on the first round? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Then on the second round, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to ask a similar question that I asked the last couple times. Has uh, so starting with you, Dr. Zachary, uh, have you received the modeling data from Alberta Health? Uh, modeling data is on Alberta Health's website. Um, this, that, that was the, the, the recent data that's have been talked about being released. I just hadn't known if it was released yet. So it, it has been released. Yes, that, that data has been released. OK, yeah. perfect. And with that in mind, then, Mr. Corbold, have we reviewed it? And do we have any questions about it from an administration perspective? I didn't realize it's been released at this stage. Um, I have not personally taken a look at, but I'll just see if um, Ms. Poirier wants to comment on that. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to review that data, so we will look at that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to know if there's anything we should take away from that, but I mean, that's that's fine. So if it's out there, that's that's great, good, as I know folks have been waiting for it for a while. So uh, great. Uh, those are all my questions, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Dr. Zachary, um, I often hear uh, that people who are not vaccinated uh, yeah. do make a major portion of uh, hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, could you uh, uh, maybe uh, put me at ease with the numbers? Like, you know, do we know? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the question, uh, Councillor. So the, the, I would like to highlight the fact, yes, that uh, most of the hospitalization and ICU visits are among who are unimmunized as well as partially vaccinated. And, and this highlights the importance of the immunization processes. Um, there is a readily available vaccine that is safe and effective. Um, and 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 this also given the fact that where our ICU and hospitalization is currently tied and stressed, this highlights the need for um, reducing, reducing transmission within our community. Uh, the current data that I, I do have is that it's around the 90% for unimmunized. And I apologize, I don't have the exact number at this point in time. But it's around. It has been around the ninety percent, uh, or sometimes greater, among the unimmunized uh, uh, populations. Okay, uh, for the new case numbers, uh, uh, we get. Uh, I mean, again, they're uh, fairly high. And uh, could you tell me if uh, people who are fully vaccinated, they can test positive again, or is there? Uh, that's a great question, Councillor. So those who are fully vaccinated, and I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit on the public health principle of vaccine effectiveness. So vaccines are effective, especially after two doses, in reduction of transmission, as well as to a significant extent to hospitalization and ICU visits and severe outcomes. Some cases could still test positive, but could be asymptomatic or having mild illness despite of the vaccination. And as we all know, the vaccine effectiveness, specifically with the Delta variant, which is around, I believe, 98% of the circulating viruses in our community, um, is highly transmissible. However, vaccine is highly effective to an extent of almost 90% with two doses in reduction of transmission of the Delta variant. That being said, it could be around other 10% that could still test positive. However, the likelihood of having severe outcome is very, very, very minimal. So vaccines are very, very effective in reduction and decreasing the likelihood to a significant extent of any severe outcomes of this virus. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Corporal, uh, another uh, question for you is, uh, uh, just to be clear that uh, uh, whatever um, authority we delegate to you in uh, exempting people from uh, I guess, uh, depending on their situation, from wearing or not wearing masks, um, it would be they cannot supersede uh, uh, provincial health orders, right? That would be our recommendation if, if the committee wants to take this to council, is that um, that my, de my delegation authority would, would be allowed to make some exemptions, but not any exemptions that conflict with the provincial health order. Okay. And, uh, and the other question I had, uh, I know you said uh, uh, the, disclosure, uh, the disclosure rate is about 65% currently, but it's uh, between 65 and uh, way up high in some others. Could you be able to um, uh, tell me if, you know, uh, if uh, one union uh, is uh, more actively, uh, I guess, uh, asking their uh, their uh, uh, employees to uh, disclose than the others or their uh, 
Well, three unions have, have sent messages out to their members. So like I said, the ATU, the Edmonton Fire Unions, and International Brotherhood of Electric Workers. So they have actually actively sent positive messages out to their members, uh, encouraging them to, uh, to disclose. Um, I don't yet have the full data um, uh, as to which have, have disclosed or not. I, we're generally getting a lot of disclosure. Uh, I think in the first three days we had 51% uh, of employees disclose. So a lot of people have, n have not sort of hesitated to do so. But I'll see if Ms. Armstrong has any more information on that. Just one additional thing, um, Mr. Corbold, is CSU uh, also posted today um, uh, commentary encouraging their members to uh, disclose pursuant to the policy. So late breaking news in that regard. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, that's great uh, and, and very, very helpful. Um, so um, maybe back to Dr. Zachary while we've got you here for a second, sir. Um, so, uh, this, this guy could use a third dose of something right about now, it, it feels like, um, uh, what, what, uh, I, I understand rollout of third dose is proceeding is, um, uh, is, is there value in, or are there any plans, uh, at looking at establishing mass vaccination capacity, uh, something like the expo center and those other sites again, or, or is it, are you? Do you know uh, whether it's more likely that it's going to go through pharmacies for the, the third, or what the plan for that? And can the city assist in any way? That's a great question, Mr. Moore. Thank you so much. So, uh, as Alberta Health has uh, set the criteria for the third dose, including eligible immunocompromised condition, as well as uh, for uh, some travel purposes. Um, Third dose of vaccination, uh, if someone is deemed eligible, they could first, and I would encourage this to consult with the health provider first to discuss the, their own personal uh, health and the eligibility criteria. We're also from a medical office of health office perspective, we're happy to receive consultations from our colleague and to be able to uh, sift through this process. Um, in terms of uh, Booking, this could be done through an aid test and also participate in pharmacies. Um, the details around this is uh, explicitly also mentioned in uh, the Alberta Health website where um, aid tests, avenues, as well as participating pharmacies could be part of, of the process. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Dr. Hinshaw said something on Friday, which I don't think she'd mentioned. Uh, I don't recall her mentioning publicly before, which was the the serology data um, giving some indication that, of course, I mean, everyone who gets tested, we have a, you know, we have some data, uh, but then lots of folks, uh, uh, particularly matic, don't, um, and and uh, but that case count are 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 presumed to be higher than what is reported by some ratio typically and she mentioned as much as four four times and then she said the serology data indicates that um there may be in fact significantly more cases uh, all to say the viral load notwithstanding vaccination and the break it puts on transmissibility um that there's there is significant community transmission occurring at this time Fair to say? Well, um, as I highlighted earlier, there is a high community transmission um, at, at this point in time. And this is reflected on, on the data that we do have. And this could include the rates of cases, hospitalization ICU, our values. Um, and yeah, there is high community transmission That's at this point in time. And uh, wastewater uh, testing happening? Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Mayor. So uh, we do know uh, Alberta Health is uh, supporting that process of wastewater surveillance program. It's another surveillance measure or uh, a tool, a very useful tool 
to allow for the detection of including COVID-19 activity. And this is going to be published re- weekly, on a weekly basis, on the Alberta Health uh, webpage for COVID-19 within a part of the ongoing reporting. Um, wastewater surveillance as a method from a public health standpoint could be a useful tool to detect the viral activity within the community uh, versus testing, which also which only test detects uh, the activity for those who only choose to get tested. So every method could have their pros and cons, and, and having wastewater wastewater surveillance as a method could be a useful tool for that, um, and could give an indication of the the circulating virus within the community, knowing that asymptomatic and symptomatic. Uh, individuals with COVID-19 could still uh, shed the virus and this could be detected uh, in sewage several days prior to the case of being reported to the community. So it's a very useful tool. Well, that's good. I'm glad we're continuing that. I do have a couple more questions, but uh, I'm out of time. But I do have a test book for 2.30 now, so so we'll know uh, what I'm dealing with here eventually. Here, um, Councillor Paquette, I think you're still on the first that's right first round okay thank you mr mayor um and uh, thank you everyone uh for the information today um dr zachary um just just based on on the science uh if vaccination rates do not increase from what we're seeing right now um and knowing that we are generally two weeks out from uh, new information because of uh, the way that COVID uh, uh, s- symptoms start to exhibit. Um, and knowing that we're about where the November and December rates were last year, um, and it's only going up, and we know that it's actually going to go up over the next two weeks regardless. Um, are we, are the current provincial uh, mandates enough to um, slow the spread, or not slow the spread, to halt the spread, to reverse the, the spread. If if things stay relatively the same, the way that they are now, as far as vaccination rates and with the current uh, restrictions, um, are we looking at a reversal? Thank you, Councillor. That's, uh, that's a good question. And it, it has, several layers in, in, in the question. So I can, from a public health standpoint, we, we can't really predict 100% that if status remains as is, we would see the same patterns as last year. Because we have a powerful tool now, which is vaccine, which we didn't have last year. Okay, and, um, just I'm going to interrupt you there. Yeah, I understand all of that. Yeah. Um, I understand that we can't predict 100%, but based yeah. on what we know scientifically, is it reasonable to assume that with the current restrictions and current vaccination rates, we will not be seeing a reversal? Well, at, at this point in time, we do have the tools in place in terms of... Yes, but, we know what the uptake of vaccinations are. We know this. We've had experience for many weeks now, for months actually. So with the current uh, restrictions in place and with the current vaccination um, uptake in place, is it reasonable to assume that numbers are going to start reversing? Or is it reasonable to assume that it, prob- it probably won't be reversing with the current situation um, uh, as and I understand that vaccinations are uh, our best tool I understand that uh, you know we have to keep doing hand washing and distancing and uh, wearing masks I understand all of these things so I don't need uh, a review of those with with apologies here but my time is short my question my question is very simple actually and and it's it's really challenging to predict because the situation changes 
and it's changed drastically. But and barring it, any other changes, knowing what we know, with the experience we know, based on the science, with the current restrictions, and with the current uptake of vaccinations, most experts are saying that it will not reverse. Well, my understanding is that Alberta Health, as an entity for providing recommendations for policy based on evidence, they do have their modeling data. And modeling, as previously mentioned, is a useful tool to pr predict possibilities. And again, it's not 100% guaranteed. And the situation okay. that we learned is it's very changing, very evolving. Yes. And the parameters okay. that change... I'm, the I'm, I'm running out of time. I have one more question to get to. I appreciate your time. I really do. Um, unfortunately, we, are, we have our time restrictions here. Um, just... Uh, Mr. Corbold, uh, Andre, um, what metrics uh, will you use for exemptions if uh, if that's the route that committee takes to refer this to council? Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Uh, I, I guess uh, I'll start by answering. I would, I would, you know, one not do anything that conflicts with the provincial order. In terms of um, um, metrics, we would take sort of reasonable occupational health and standard uh, uh, protocols in each of these. You'd have to have some sort of a protocol. But in terms of metrics, uh, are you referring to case counts? Case counts, vaccination rates, uh, vaccination rates of those who cannot be vaccinated, like children, um, what we know about community spread, yeah. Um, you know, we've got a full gamut of uh, potential information to draw from. So I'm just wondering what you will be drawing from. Yeah, I think, I mean, like we said at the last council meeting, the cases per 100,000 seems to be one of the most effective um, uh, measurements in terms of what's going on in the community. And so we'll continue to, um, you know, follow that. Of course, the, the bylaw states that those restrictions are not in place under 100. And as I mentioned today, we're three times that right now. So... Those are the kind of metrics we'd look at. Yeah. Okay. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. I think we can ask that question better, uh, Mr. Corbold. What criteria would you use uh, with regards to, in your mindset, if we gave you the delegated authority for exemption? The key criteria in my mind would be what mit mitigation efforts have put uh, in been put in place uh, to prevent spread. So. For example, with performers, if there's, you know, distancing or plexiglass between the performers and the customers, that would be a, a very important mitigation effort uh, that would prompt me to allow that exemption. But as I indicated with, you know, dance floors, there, there's a very difficult way to, to mitigate that. So that would be more difficult to exempt. But those type of mitigation things, which are all based on, uh, occupational health and safety standards in many ways would be very helpful. Because uh, I think it's important to state, Mr. Corbell, that it's not all about masks. It's about a bunch of things, as we've said over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. And so there's physical correct. barriers, there are masks, there's social distancing and so on. And, and again, I'll reiterate my concern is making sure we have clarity so we have sufficient flexibility so common sense can prevail. I guess that is what I'm, I'm concerned for you because <laughs> I want to get you out of trouble, not into trouble, that that is very clear and that you do not come across as arbitrary. arbitrary. No, I appreciate that. And that's exactly it. And I'll use the example here in council chambers where, you know, we have highly mitigated uh, with plexiglass in particular in this chambers to allow us to uh, debate and talk uh, without wearing masks while we're seated. And then the moment we get up, we, we put our masks on as we move about chambers. And that is a good example of good mitigation from an occupational health and safety. And also an example of where we did a formal occupational health and safety assessment before we made that decision. And so that would be my expectation of, of owners in the, in, the, in the hospitality space is that they do what their law requires, which is a, uh, uh, an assessment of their space. So my, my last question goes to capacity and mechanics. 
So let's say on Friday, uh, we give you this delegated authority. There is, so you will be inundated, no doubt, inundated with hundreds, if not more, uh, requests for uh, exemption. So I guess the question becomes, uh, can you handle it and in a timely fashion? Yes. Uh, that, that is, obviously, that's going to be an issue around the table, right? Yeah, I'm confident we can handle it. Um, I, I, w I wouldn't further delegate the decisions in any way within the city. I don't need to do that. We, we would make it uh, as least bureaucratic as possible. I can use tables and other tools to make sure that we're getting answers uh, quickly. We've already done quite a few discussions with the BIAs on this, and they're certainly helping uh, in order to communicate with their folks. And, and we, we would make things clear. And, and even by some of the things we've talked about today, you know, if it's made very clear at the beginning that uh, we're not going to conflict with the provincial health order, then you'll know you're going to get a negative answer if you try to suggest something that conflicts with that order. No, now that speaks to the nimbleness of what's going to go on. And then let's talk about the, 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 the other end is verification. It's, it's, you know, the line is very simple. I trust you, but how is verification got a handle on that piece? Yeah, well, in terms of verifications, we, we will enforce. We can't be everywhere at the same time, but we can certainly, uh, as a priority, follow up with, with those folks who are taking uh, variances and variances we approve. There's also two enforcement mechanisms here because there is the ongoing health order. There's a Alberta occupational or Alberta health enforcement for, for those things that are provincial focused and then our own bylaw enforcement. So um, obviously we can't be everywhere, but I think we have a good sense of where the risk areas are. So here it is. It's clarity on, on how you want to approach exemptions. And then number two, do you have uh, the nimbleness to answer the question and then number th uh, on the exemptions then number three hopefully you will have capacity and bodies to verify particularly uh, events of that uh, probably will be larger than some as to their uh, application of the rules does that make sense yes i think we can do all of that um and uh i'm confident that we've got the capacity to do that okay okay thank you um so just a couple more questions on the, um, uh, I mean, I, th I think I'm hearing a consensus that uh, delegating you some authority, uh, particularly through the uh, sort of caretaker period that's coming up here, um, makes sense. Uh, so we, we need to adjust the bylaw that way. Um, and that gives you the ability to sort of deal with whatever comes up. But in the interests of of providing any other clarity that we could in the meantime. Are there any other amendments, particularly around this live music piece, uh, where we might be able to provide some additional clarity uh, if we're drafting uh, for for Friday, just so that some of those can be dealt with kind of omnibus as opposed to case by case exemptions having to come through to you? Is there any value in getting ahead of that or and anything, any other categories that have come up? A possible exemption where we could make some uh, some blanket moves by Friday. Um, I, I believe there are, uh, Your Worship, but I think we've got that in hand based on our discussions with the hospitality industry and the BIA. So we can certainly uh, embed that in our recommendations to council when we come back uh, with uh, specific additions uh, and adjustments to the the order. So it wouldn't simply be about the delegation, but we might be able to provide some clarity directly in the order. Uh, on some of the things we've talked about today uh, so that it reduces the number of exemptions we might see for whatever reason. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just whatever you can do to <laughs> provide clarity sooner to, to that industry, even in advance of the weekend, ideally, um, uh, they'll appreciate from what we're hearing. And, and if it lightens the, the load on your office um, further to the previous line of questioning. So... All right, then mechanically to do that, um, uh, we can, uh, you, between you and I at this point, based on this feedback, we can call a special council meeting for Friday morning for the purposes of entertaining uh, adjustments to the bylaw, and then you can bring those forward um, on an emergent basis for Friday, I, um, rather than trying to give direction, which is awkward to do from this committee, uh, just because of its limited mandate. 
I mean, you and I can undertake at this point to, to call that meeting based on this discussion, if that works for you. That absolutely works for us, Your Worship, thanks. Okay, all right. Well, I, I think that, that sends a, a clear signal that, that we've got, um, uh, we recognize there's a bit of tuning to the bylaw based on feedback from business and the performing arts community uh, and that um, good discussion otherwise here. So, so we'll have one more, <clears throat> I guess we will have one more council meeting. So uh, this has been really helpful. Thank you, Dr. Zachary, for making yourself available to us. Uh, I'm glad we kept this meeting in the schedule given the circumstances here. So, um, uh, would someone care to move receipt of information of item 3.1? So moved. Councillor Banga. Uh, any further discussion? Not seeing any, then please vote on receipt of information. Yes. Uh, sent me a note indicating something came up for her and she had to drop off the call. Thank you, so. Councillor Zadik. Uh, we have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, display the vote, please. We are so informed, that carries unanimously. Good discussion, folks. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to Andre, to you and your team for being flexible around this. So uh, that concludes the Emergency Advisory Committee meeting uh, for today. I don't think we're gonna do a briefing afterwards because um, uh, I think the the implications are fairly straightforward. We can look to what we need to do for media availabilities in and around the draft bylaw coming forward and the, uh, uh, the, the outcomes from Friday's meeting to make bylaw adjustments. So, <clears throat> all right. See something.